Good evening, aspirants. Welcome to editorial analysis of today's newspaper. In this video, we are going to discuss two editorial articles. The first one is about the challenges in infrastructure and the solution. It is the editorial article from Hindu newspaper. The second one is about the reforms in United Nations and what needs to be done. This is from Indian Express newspaper. So these are the two editorial articles we are going to discuss today. Let us start the discussion. Look at the first article. It discusses India's challenges with infrastructure development, highlighting frequent collapses and delays in government projects. Despite increased government investment, infrastructure remains plagued by various reasons like delays, cost to overrun and quality issues. So the article emphasized the importance of a robust program management system and it also suggests adopting global standards to improve the infrastructure execution in India. So this is the crux of the news article given here. In this context, let us discuss the important points from this article. Firstly, what are the benefits of infrastructure development for a country? The first one is economic growth. Infrastructure leads to increased productivity. Well-developed infrastructure like roads, port and energy system helps business to operate efficiently and thereby it reduces the transportation and production cost and increases the productivity. The next is attracting FDI. Improved infrastructure will attract both domestic and foreign investors as it ensures efficient operation, access to market and low operational cost. The next one is social development. A good infrastructure will lead to better healthcare access and wider access to healthcare services especially in rural and remote areas. Well-built schools and better access to education facilities lead to improved literacy rates and skill development which drives the long-term economic progress. Infrastructure development in water supply and sanitation improves public health, reduces diseases and ensures a better quality of life. The infrastructure projects like roads, electricity and communication networks in rural areas also enable economic activities, increase employment and reduce regional disparities. So this creates opportunities for economically disadvantaged and enables them to access markets, education and healthcare services, thereby reducing power. Investing in renewable energy infrastructure like solar, wind and hydroelectric power helps to reduce the dependency on fossil fuels. So this will ensure the energy security of India. It also reduces the environmental impact. For example, the infrastructure projects that incorporate sustainable practices like green buildings and efficient public transport system will lead to environmental conservation and reduce pollution. So these are the important advantages of infrastructure development in a country. Now let us see what are the impacts of poor infrastructure development. The first one is hindered economic growth. A poor infrastructure such as inadequate roads and unreliable power supply will increase the production and logistic cost for business. So this reduces the efficiency and profitability of manufacturing sector. It also leads to lowering of FDI. Inadequate infrastructure will discourage investors which will affect the economic growth in long run. The next one is poor connectivity. Without proper roads, railways and transport systems, it is very hard for agricultural producers to access the local and national markets. So thereby it reduces their competitiveness and decreases their income. So limited market access is one of the major drawback of poor infrastructure development. The next one is geographical isolation. The remote areas remain disconnected which leaves the residents without access to essential services like health care and education. So the poor infrastructure development disproportionately affects the weaker sections of population. The next major drawback is stagnation in job creation. Infrastructure projects create direct and indirect jobs and the lack of infrastructure development means fewer construction projects and employment opportunities. So this disproportionately affects the low skilled labor who rely on infrastructure projects and construction works. Without necessary infrastructure, industries like manufacturing, agriculture and services struggle to grow thereby it limits the job creation in these sectors. So these are the negative impacts of poor infrastructure development in a country. Now let us see what are the government initiatives for infrastructure development. The first one is National Infrastructure Pipeline. It was launched in 2019 and it aims to provide a forward looking roadmap for infrastructure projects. The projects include energy, transportation, water and urban infrastructure. See, the government plan to invest around 111 lakh crore by 2025. So the key focus areas are energy, roads, railways, urban development and rural infrastructure. So this is about national infrastructure pipeline project. The next one is Gadi Shakti national master plan. It was launched in 2021. The objective of this plan was to facilitate coordinated planning and implementation of infrastructure projects to reduce the delays and bottlenecks. So it is created for smoother functioning of infrastructure projects. The sectors like roads, railways, ports, airports and mass transportation, waterways and logistics infrastructure were covered under this 
Gadi Shakti. Basically, the aim of Gadi Shakti is to integrate various ministries with a common digital platform, thereby it ensures a better synchronization and coordination between all ministries. So, this is about Gadi Shakti National Master Plan. The next is about Smart Cities Mission. As we all know, it was introduced in 2015. It is aimed to promote sustainable urban development, which can provide core infrastructure and improved quality of life. The main focus is on infrastructure development in urban areas, which includes housing, sanitation, public transport, IT connectivity. The next one is Pradhan Mantri Gram Sadak Yojana. It was launched in 2000 and it is currently ongoing phase 4. The aim is to improve the road connectivity in rural areas, which will provide all weather roads to unconnected villages. So, providing the rural road connectivity, it enhances the access to healthcare and education in rural areas. So, this is about Pradhan Mantri Gram Sadak Yojana. The next one is Jal Jeevan Mission. It was launched in 2019 and the objective is to provide tap water connection to all households in rural India by 2024. It aims to improve the infrastructure for water supply, thereby ensuring water security and promoting rainwater harvesting and water conservation efforts. So, please note that the rainwater harvesting and water conservation is also part of Jal Jeevan mission besides giving tap water connection to all households. The next important initiative is Atal Mission for Rejuvenation and Urban Transformation which is simply called as Amrut. It was launched in 2015 and it aims to improve infrastructure for water supply, sewage and urban transport. In Jaljivan Mission, the main focus was providing piped water supply. Here it was water supply, sewage and urban transport. So, it mainly focuses on improving these conditions in 500 cities. The focus area for this mission are urban renewal, especially in terms of providing better basic services in water and sewage. So, sewage management is also a part of Amrut mission. Now, let us see some important challenges in infrastructure development. The first major challenge is poor management. See, there was a lack of structured project management in India. This is because of limited technical expertise with the government. It also led to delays and inefficiencies in project execution. Also, there was insufficient planning and monitoring and also insufficient coordination which often results in extended deadlines. So, for addressing this only, the government has initiated Gadi Shakti plan to coordinate between different parts of government missionaries. The next is cost overruns. See, the infrastructure projects often face increased cost due to mismanagement and delays. It is also due to inflation and underestimation while project approval. So, thereby the cost for infrastructure project will increase as over time and which will lead to delay in project execution. The third one is mismanagement of funds. See, the corruption in public works often leads to poor project quality and delays. So, corruption is also an important challenge in infrastructure development in India. The fourth one is land acquisition issues. For infrastructure projects like road and railways, there were protests and delays in acquiring land which leads to delays in executing the project. This is especially for large scale projects like like national highways. Then there is lack of skilled workforce. The lack of skilled labor and project managers hampers the project execution at government level. The last one is about inadequate urban planning. See the rapid urbanization like the cities like Chennai which leads to congested areas and infrastructure struggles to keep pace with the demands. So, the inadequate urban planning is also an important challenge in infrastructure development. Now, let us see some points as way forward for these challenges. The first one is streamlined regulatory framework. There should be proper coordination and synchronization between various parts of ministries and government agencies thereby reducing the bureaucracy red tapeism to allow fast track project approvals. The next one is increased public private partnership. There should be increased private investment with the tax breaks and stable policies to mitigate the risk regarding delay in project management. So, involving private in infrastructure development will increase the efficiency of infrastructure development. The third one is sustainable infrastructure development. Designing infrastructure with the climate resilience and sustainability and adaptability for growing congested cities and incorporating green building practices will lead to the development of sustainable infrastructure and it also helps with the rapid urbanization in cities like Chennai and Mumbai which are growing rapidly and congesting due to unplanned urbanization. The fourth one is about the effective land acquisition loss. Creating fair land acquisition loss and compensating the landowners adequately will lead to faster approval of projects and thereby lead to faster completion of infrastructure projects like road and railways. The fifth one is boosting rural infrastructure. Beyond developing infrastructure projects like national highways, port cities and railways, the government should also focus on increasing the rural infrastructure to bridge the 
urban rural divide. So this will provide better market access for farmers and weaker sections in remote areas. So these are some of the way forward points for the challenges in infrastructure development. So in this discussion, we have seen the benefits of infrastructure development, what are the challenges in it and what are the government initiatives for infrastructure in India and then we have seen some way forward points for them. So with this, let us conclude the discussion. This is a main question related to this topic. Interested aspirants can use this and write a main answer. Look at this article. There was a United Nations summit which is going to happen later this month. The summit was named as the UN Summit of Future. Prime Minister Modi is going to New York to attend this summit. So in this context, the article is discussing about the challenges in United Nations and what needs to be done. Let us discuss this in the video. Firstly, about the history of United Nations. The UN Charter was signed on June 26, 1945 and it laid the foundational treaty which outlines the purpose, principle and structure of organization. The aim is to promote international peace, security and cooperation and to address the challenges of League of Nations Treaty which was signed in World War I. So the United Nations aimed to promote the international peace and to act as a better alternative for the League of Nations. Now let us see the structure of United Nations. The first is General Assembly. It comprises all member states and it is the main deliberative body of United Nations. Each member has one vote. Then Security Council. It has five permanent members who are called as P5 and there were 10 non-permanent members. So these 15 members form the Security Council and the five permanent members have special power called veto power. Then there is Economic and Social Council. It focuses on economic, social and environmental issues. It also coordinates specialist agencies like WHO, UNESCO and other agencies. Then International Court of Justice. It is created to settle legal disputes between nations and it is headquartered at Hague in Netherlands. So this is the basic structure of United Nations. This also includes Secretariat and Trusteeship Council. The Secretariat oversees day-to-day -day operations and the Secretariat is headed by Secretary General. The Trusteeship Council is formed to oversee the decolonization and administer the trust territories which are held with United Nations. This Trusteeship Council was suspended its operation in 1994. So now there was only five major parts of United Nations. Now looking at the membership, there were 51 countries as founding members which also included P5 members and India was also a founding member of United Nations. The current membership is 193 member states. It includes almost all internationally recognized sovereign states. The P5 countries were US, France, Soviet Union, China and United Kingdom. So these five countries were originally part of the founding members in UN and now they are the P5 countries in Security Council. Other countries like Brazil, Egypt, Canada, India also joined the United Nations as founding members. The Holy See which is the Vatican City, Palestine remains as observer states in United Nations. Now what is the relevance of UN today's world? UN continues to be a key platform for global diplomacy on issues like peace, climate change and sustainable development. So here the keyword is multilateral diplomacy. The rise in unilateral actions by powerful states and geopolitical tensions like Russia-Ukraine war are the challenges to multilateralism and UN acts as a checks and balance for these challenges. Now what are the challenges faced by UN? The first one is structural issues. See the P5 countries which were permanent members of Security Council has veto power and these P5 countries will take unilateral decision which leads to paralysis in conflict resolution. For example, there is no common ground arrived at Syrian civil war and Ukraine crisis. And even now in Gaza crisis, there is no solution created by United Nations. There was also power politics and geopolitical conflicts and selective intervention in global issues. This is because the major funding resources and budget is given by the members itself and it leads to dependency on member states for funding. There is also underfunding of peacekeeping missions in Africa. Another important challenge is non-binding of resolutions. See, most of the resolutions taken by United Nations are non-binding and it lacks enforcement mechanism. So it is very hard to reach peace in global issues like Israel-Palestine conflict and Russia-Ukraine war. Now let us see some way forward. The first one is there need to be a reform in veto power. The Security Council must be reformed and its membership has to be expanded to other developing countries. There should be representation of emerging powers like India and Brazil in P5 countries. Then democratization of global governance. As we saw earlier, the P5 countries are dominated by Western nations and there should be inclusion of non-Western nations and emerging economies. Then reviving global trust. There should be proper conflict mediation and more powers to be given to peacekeeping missions and multilateral diplomacy should be strengthened by eliminating the veto powers for P5 countries. So this will revive the global trust on United Nations. So these are some of the way forward which we can give for the challenges 
in the structure of United Nations. Now let us see India's role and advocacy for reforms. First is leadership in Global South. India represents the interest of developing nations in climate negotiations, trade disputes and global governance reforms. India's permanent representative to United Nations like Ruchira Kambuch and External Affairs Minister Jay Shankar have consistently highlighted the need for Security Council reforms. By using platforms like G20, Shanghai Cooperation Organization, BRICS, India seeks to strengthen the multilateralism beyond United Nations and away from P5 powers. So this is all about the discussion. Here we have seen the basic structure of United Nations, what are the challenges in the structure and what can be done to reform the United Nations. With this, let us conclude the discussion. This is the main question regarding this topic interested aspirants can use it with this we have come to the end of the discussion if you like the video please share it with your friends and don't forget to subscribe to shankara academy youtube channel thank you for watching